On this video, you will be listening to Gustave Leroux from God Ministries, uh, ministering a message from one of our spirit schools. This will greatly propel you, take you deeper into the kingdom, give you greater understanding and revelation. Enjoy. Bless you and please subscribe. Thank you. Father, we just want to glorify your name tonight. Thank you for being inside of you, Lord. Thank you that we as sons and daughters can literally be in the entirety of Yahweh. The Yod, the Hay, the Vav, the Head. We step into you. We step into your four faces. Father, we step into every dimension and every realm that is within you, Father, and all of that becomes part of us, becomes one with us. We begin to have revelation, understanding regarding all that's out there, and all because we are in you, because we are worshiping and magnifying and glorifying and, and giving of ourselves to you. Father, the marriage covenant that we have with you is mind-blowing. That everything that's yours is mine, and everything that's mine is yours. And I know that all that you want from us is our lives. But Father, what we get in return is just mind-blowing. It's just beyond what we can ever fathom or understand. But thank you that we can step into you, Lord. Thank you for that vibration, that, that collaboration, that intensity that it creates father in our being as we step into you that oh, that spirit filling that breath taking that uh, overshadowing of life that takes place in our spirit being that when relates that fullness to my soul and my body that shifts my entire world into place just because i'm in you lord thank you that we through the walk of our walk in the spirit the walk with you we can get to a place in our lives where we can bring crowns before your throne father we can lay them down at your feet at the sea of glass and we can begin to trade father and every time we give you a, a crown whether it's the crown of righteousness or the crown of life or the crown of glory or the crown of joy father you when you multiply that crown back into us it is such an extreme multiplication that comes back that, that there's almost a shaking in the core of our being that takes place because you are a God that wants to multiply back what we give you to such a degree that we can't fathom it in the natural so tonight well I pray for revelation regarding the crown of life I pray Father that you will begin to open our hearts and begin to have us understand what you have given us the gift of life the gift of the fullness of this life that we live in you Father So we step, I want you to do this, I want you to do this with me, step into the yard. And the idea that, the way the Hebrew people would do it is they would, they would breathe their entire breath out into the yard. And then they would breathe their entire breath out into the hay, and they would breathe their entire breath out in the valve, and again they would breathe their entire breath out into the hay. Do you guys want to do that? It's like a, almost like a song they would sing, and it goes like this, it's, it's the yard, and you go, yard, until all your breath is out. You guys want to do that with me? I want you to close your eyes, and I want you to just see yourself stepping in, and, and you haven't done the Hebrew letters yet, but the yard, and the hay, and the valve, and the hay, the meaning behind these letters, it's the living creatures, the living word of Yahweh, that which protruded out of the mouth of Yeshua when he created the heavens and the earth. They are living beings. And every one of these letters represents a fiery being that has dimensions of Yahweh and represents dimensions of Yahweh for each of us to engage with. <coughs> okay, so let's do the yard. <coughs> yard.
find yourself stepping into him. I want you to see that in the spirit. Father, we do the same with Yeshua. Step into the yard. Step into the hay. Step into the shin. Step into the valve. And we step into the hay. Step deep into all that is there for us as sons and daughters to surround ourselves with. And Father, we pray and ask that tonight you will begin to enhance our understanding regarding everything that you have for us in this time and season of our lives. We love you, my King. We glorify your name. Amen. constantly do that. I find myself doing it in the car when I wake up in the morning, when I'm on my way to the gym in the morning to go do a spinning class. That, that vibration of the yard and the understanding behind that letter and what it does in the spirit and the same with the, the hay and the valve and the extreme glory that comes with engaging the Father in that manner, stepping into Him, allowing Him at that point to surround you with all of Him, with with the glory and the fire, with the, with the intensity of the fullness of who He is as you step into it. Now, in essence, we don't step out of it because He's omnipresent. You can't go anywhere. You can't hide from God. I mean, you know that. <laughs> That's exciting. So, I urge you to do that. If you don't understand it, you can, uh, you can literally go on Amazon and you can buy some of the books that they have on the living letters of the Hebrew language. Um, I bought some of the books, but my teachings is really, there's a, a very small portion, there's the very basics of the Hebrew letters, and I would urge you to go listen to them. Um, I did, I'm busy with a new series or a new session at the Picayune School, and um, I must be honest with you, we started two weeks ago, and the first week I did one letter. And I thought, well, like last time I did it, I did two, three, or maybe sometimes four letters at a time. And the second time I did, again, just one letter. An hour teaching on one letter. <laughs> and of course, the reason being is the deeper I go into the kingdom of heaven, the more I engage with these fiery beings. And they are mind-blowing. And I always want to say, and I want to remind you that in the spirit, you can engage with whatever you want as long as you're in the right spirit direct dimension, <laughs> right? You don't want to, you want to engage with any form of demonic. You always want to go up and down, which means you want to go into the kingdom of heaven. You want to spend time, intimate time with Yeshua, intimate time with Yahweh. You want to be intimate with the Father. You want to spend time with the Holy Spirit. You want to be in that kingdom and be led from there into whichever other area you, you're taken into, either by one of the seven spirits, by one of the angelic canopies that's assigned to your name or to your calling or to uh, your ministry or what your Father has called you to. You don't just want to go walk to and throw in the earth. Now, it's not a good idea. You don't know what, what you can bring back into, into your today if you do that. So it's always good to be led by the Spirit in everything you do when you're out in the Spirit. Um, you know, the fiery, the fiery beings, for me, first time I saw them, I had no idea what they were. Matter of fact, it freaked me out a little bit because I was in the kingdom of heaven and I was engaging with the Father and these living things came at me. And it was like I said to the school last, last week, but it's like a fiery explosion within a creature that you can't explain or express in its, in its looks because there's nothing like it on the earth. <laughs> so it, it approaches you and it really just wants to engage with you. It's like a, a fiery explosion that explodes towards you and it's kind of freaky, but once you engage with it, that fiery flame is revelation. It's the living word that wants to protrude into you. Now I say the living word, and I need you to understand it, is that which the Father, or Yeshua, spoke out over creation from the very beginning of, of life. And that goes beyond what we can fathom or understand right now. But I need you to 
in your, in your time with Yahweh to engage with that as much as you can. It's changed my life. As a matter of fact, let me tell you, in the, in the New Orleans school, um, we've been going for about two years, and people were kind of catching the revelation, and they were going into it, and they were going into the spirit realm, and they were having a good time, but they didn't really catch the fullness of it until I started teaching on the letters. And then all of a sudden, just out of the blue, they started trading. They started understanding and having revelation because the, the 22 living letters literally express and explain the character of the entirety of Yahweh. Wow. And, and the understanding of that, I mean, there's some books that has 20 to 40 pages on one letter. Wow. <laughs> wow. I mean, that's beyond what we can even begin to understand. That's one living being that it's not even, they're not even talking about it uh, in the heavens, they're talking about it in the natural capacity. In the heavens there's an even greater revelation. But I mean, like I said, I have very, very small knowledge of these living beings, only that which I've engaged and uh, the little paragraph that I've written down in my notes about each of them. And I can, eat, I can teach on each of them for an hour. Now, the rate that I speak at is about between 12 and 15,000 words on, on one letter. <laughs> it's mind-blowing. We have been, uh, we've been touching on the crowns. There's uh, seven different crowns, maybe more. I think I have in my notes seven of them. And, and the idea behind these crowns is, is the, the, the dimensions that you have walked in as you've grown in Christ. The things that you have experienced, the changes you've had, and then of course the things that you've walked in, and then of course we have the understanding that Satan, and all of that I've gone through and walked through, has the desire, an, an extensive desire, to come take from that which the Father has given me. Okay, so when we, uh, I want to go through the, I have to go to my, up, up somewhere else too, to maybe just go through it, because some of you went here last week. But if I have to express these crowns, it's the crown of righteousness, got the crown of life, the crown of glory, the incorruptible crown, you've got the crown of the anointing oil, you've got the crown of rejoicing or joy, or joy, you've got the crown, the servant king crown, and these are just some of them, but this is seven that we'll be talking about teaching. And if you understand, the 24 elders in the scripture would lay down their, their crowns at the feet of, of Yahweh. Okay, the idea is always trading. You know, if I have the crown of righteousness, let me remind you, you have worked for what you've earned. Now, I know we, we uh, don't understand the work that the Father wants us to have revelation of because you don't work for righteousness. But how many of you understand, for me to have revelation of righteousness, there's a dimension of work that has to go into it. And for me to understand my righteousness, I have to, if I have full revelation of righteousness, I have to be righteous. It's not just a gift, although it is a gift, for me to understand and believe that the gift of righteousness has or rests upon me, I have to live a righteous life. And so there's work involved. And so when I take that crown and I lay it at the feet of, of Yahweh, He multiplies it back to me in its uh, uh, full understanding of what it means to carry that, that crown. Now I, make you, I, want, I want you to understand that the crowns is what you look like and what's, what you are represented by in the spirit. So it's what the enemy sees when he looks at you. It's what the angelic canopy sees when they look at you. It's what the Father sees when he looks at you. It's what you carry, what you have on your shoulders, your mantles, the battens, the crowns that you've earned as you've walked with Him, the, the, the deep dimensions of going into the Father, spending time with Him, changing your life as you stop smoking, stop drinking, stop sleeping around, stop gossiping, stop this, stop this, there's a little doo-doo list that we have. But the idea is really to just go deeper and deeper into the Father, and all these things kind of fade out of our lives, right? Because the Father's desire for us to be holy. And in this process of life that we walk in, we will start adding all these crowns to our lives. But it's also in the same breath very easy to lose these crowns because it can be knocked off in the spirit by man. It can be knocked off by you through sin. And it can be taken or stolen by the enemy just because he is a son of a motherless goat. Don't look at me with that tongue. <laughs> He's got no reason to do it, but he hates you with such passion that he would take from you as far and as much as he can. 
And of course, he only takes from you when he has reason to. Because man would come to you and say, you know, um, you, you, you've been prophesying, and every time you prophesy, you, you miss it. You know, maybe 90% of the time you're right, but 10% of the time you miss it. So immediately a crown is taken from you because in your subconscious you're saying to yourself, well, then I'm just not going to prophesy again. And before you know it, you stop prophesying. You don't want to prophesy over people in front of people. You might, might speak over someone uh, when it's just you and him or you and her, but you no longer do what you used to do. So something has changed, something is amiss because the enemy is taken from you. You know, I remember I shared this last week, but I backslid for a season um, many, many years ago. But in the backslidden time, I stopped operating in the gifts. Because obviously I was backslidden, right? I was sleeping around, using drugs, doing all kinds of things. When I came back, um, I still had the knowledge and the understanding and perception of all of that stuff. But I no longer had the ability to operate in the gifts. Now you have to understand, the Bible is very clear on the fact that God does not take the gifts back. Which means, in essence, I should still be able to occupy these gifts as I did from the very beginning. But because it was a crown laid upon me and taken from me by the enemy, I no longer had that ability. Until I went back into the spirit and I took back which the enemy had stolen from me. That's when I take it and I go lay it at the feet of Yahweh at the sea of glass. Where I do that trading with him and he multiplies back the crowns that was taken to my life to such an extent that it realigns me and propels me into a new place. Exciting, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, so we're doing the crown of life. Um, I'll do the crown of, of righteousness next week. I, um, I didn't want to do the crown of righteousness because I did the law of righteousness in, in, in uh, New Orleans just the other day. So I just need a little bit more time before I go back to righteousness. You know? teaching the same thing. It's not the same thing because the, uh, the law of righteousness is at a, a much deeper level than, than the crown of righteousness, but in essence it's really the same thing. Um, so I just wanted to kind of give it a bit of a break. So we're doing the crown of life, and before I continue with it, I want to read Revelations 1.12 again. And I, when I read I want you to kind of just close your eyes, and I want you to step into the Spirit, and, and when you're in the Spirit, step out of yourself and look at yourself as if you're looking into a mirror. Because what I'm going to read now is what the Father's desire is for you to look like when you're in the Spirit. Okay. Then I turned to see who was talking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven gold lampstands. Among the lampstands, there were someone like the Son of Man. So understand that someone like the Son of Man is not the Son of Man. Because Jesus is not the Son of Man. I mean, he is the Son of Man, so he's not like the Son of Man, right? That's just logic. He was wearing a long robe with a gold sash around his chest. His head um, and his hair was white like wool. In fact, as white as snow. His eyes were like flames of fire. His feet were like glowing bronze refined in a furnace. And his voice was like the sound of raging waters. In his right hand, he had seven stars. And out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. His face was like the sun when it shines in its full force. That is the image that the Father wants you to begin to understand that as you walk through these seven dimensions, these seven crowns that you need to carry in the Spirit, it's what shapes the image of what you look like to the rest of the Spirit world. And every time the enemy comes and knocks you off your feet, or every time the enemy pulls you back, into an old habit or something you used to do that you stopped or something you stopped that you didn't do and then you start doing it again. He literally takes a crown. It could be the crown of life or the crown of joy or the crown of righteousness or glory or, or whatever. But he takes from you because he knows he has the right. And then of course through the engagement of the timeline we can go back into the spirit because of course everything is exposed when we live in this realm where we were never really uh, living from until recently, right? So now that we're living in this dimension where we can go into the heavens and we're in that spirit place where the Father, where Yeshua operated from, we begin to see all things. So when you're in the spirit, you can immediately see where the enemy has taken from you. And the idea, of course, is to go into that place and take it from him. Because if I have a mountain where I store all the riches that I get from that which is taken or that which is slain in the earth, then Satan has a mountain where he stores all the stuff that he steals from the sons and daughters. So we need to understand that there's a place in the spirit you can go, we can kick devil butt and take what's yours. 
It's what we do all that in Christ. Revelation tells us that the 24 elders bow down before the one who sits on the throne. And they worship him who lives forever and ever. They put their crowns down. They cast, they lay their crowns before the throne. The crowns are important to us believers, particularly when we come before the throne. Because you see, the desire the Father has for us is to mature. And as you ever go through the, the, the steps, or not steps, through the, the dimensions of each crown, you'll quickly begin to understand how your maturity will elevate as you hit revelation regarding each of it. Because the Father's desire for you is to eventually get to the throne with your seven crowns on as a mature son. Because once you have walked through the seven dimensions of the crowns that you have to carry, you'll quickly elevate and begin to understand that you are now, now stepping into sonship, you're now stepping into the priesthood, you're now stepping into being a king, an oracle, a legislator. It's dimensions of growth, and the enemy will do everything in his power to take that from you. Exciting, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, a crown... Is the, uh, the crown mandates us to do the job and enables us to have the rulership over the circumstances that are arrayed against us. The crown is that part of you that you've worked at and gained results to or of so that you can walk in what it, it stands for. So if it's the, the crown of life, then you have that revelation of the Zoe life the Father wants you to live, which gives you great victory over all obstacles that comes your way temptation, sin, and everything else. Same with righteousness. Uh, Satan loves to knock righteousness off our head because he knows if you don't have righteousness, you have condemnation. If you operate and walk in condemnation, he has you by the... Well, no way. There's some things you can say, but you probably don't say that in church. <laughs> okay, thank you, Jesus. <clears throat> This identification releases the government of God around your life and the power of God around you into the atmosphere. It is the, the recognition, it's that which the, 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 the saints of old, it's that which the, the demonic entities, it's that which the powers and principalities of the dark and on the light side looks at when they see you in the spirit. It's what you carry, it's like a mantle. But it's the crown that you walk with. It's the, the insight that you've had regarding the things that you've experienced in your growth in the spirit. Okay. Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Amen. Now what I love about... Uh, Temptation, well, I hate temptation, but what I love about temptation is the promise Yahweh makes. And we know the promise. It says, uh, uh, when you are tempted, I will never have Satan tempt you uh, beyond what you can handle. And he says, I will lead you through temptation. Right? So I'm not going to let it go in the middle of temptation. That's what we do. We shake his hand off and say, no, wait. <laughs> this is where I want to be. You go on and wait for me on the other side of this temptation. I'm going to play around here a little bit, and I'll meet you on the other side. Right? Or is it just me? You lie, you fry. <laughs> so the idea is that he makes these promises, and to receive the crown of life, the Father's desire for us is to begin to break through. Now, to, to receive the crown of life, you have to understand, you can't have a portion of it unless you are soaked in Christ. Christ equals anointing. Anointing equals yoke destroying, burn removing power of God. Okay, that's what you need. You need, you need that yoke destroying, burn removing power because it's the yoke that binds you to... <coughs> to constantly fall for the temptations. Now, maybe in this room we don't have as much temptations that we still fall for as what we would have in a normal church meeting. But, but the idea is that we begin to understand that as we walk through these irritations and frustrations of life, the Father's promise is, and I remind you, as I say the Father's promise, it's that I am in Christ, and in Christ my DNA is no longer the same. In Christ my bloodline has changed. In Christ, I am the light, I operate in the light and through the light. And in the light and at the speed of light, I operate in a dimension where there's no time and space. Where Satan can no longer operate 
and there can no longer break through a barrier because it's two different realms and the realm that I'm in he cannot come into but I can go in and out of that realm anytime I want and I can also see into that realm from the kingdom of heaven so in essence when I if I stay in Christ and stay in the anointing stay in that dimension of life and Satan cannot penetrate and can have no results but because I live in that kingdom when I do go into the kingdom of the earth, or when I do go into the flesh, Satan's only goal is to kill, steal, and destroy. So he'll do everything in his power. That's why Paul constantly tells the body of Christ, get in the spirit, stay out of the flesh, get into the spirit, stay out of the flesh, because it's in the flesh where Satan can see you, because he's a flesh devil. So when he can see you, he will destroy you. That's why I say he's like a roaring lion. There's nothing lying about him. Okay, he's a Mickey Mouse pervert with a mic. And so we just look at him and we hear this massive growl and it sounds so scary, but in essence it's, it's nothing because he's actually under my foot. And as far as we're concerned regarding that, all the only right he has is right to my toe jam. And there's nothing else he's allowed to. Okay, and we need to understand that. We need to have a revelation regarding what Satan is. But when I step into the flesh, all of that changes. Then it's almost the exact opposite. I become the toe jam. I, I become the Mickey Mouse, he becomes the giant. Because I've got no right to operate in that realm. Because if I'm in that realm, I've given my rights back to him. Lest I operate in that realm through the spirit of Yahweh, but not just in the flesh to abide to my old life. When I'm in that realm and I abide to my old life, so I fall back into temptation, Satan will kill, steal and destroy. And it's also that time when he takes the crown of life. He takes it from you and you will find yourself constantly falling back. Going forward, getting great results, walking deep with Yahweh, falling back. Then stepping up again, going deep because your passion continues to grow, but he's taken a crown. So you no longer have the vuma you need to constantly be propelled deeper and deeper and deeper. That's also why you have to have your soul and your spirit divided. Because when your soul and your spirit is divided, you will no longer find yourself in the flesh. You guys okay? Yeah. Learning. 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 <laughs> this is the crown that is received through the trials of life. Our dealings with temptation. See, the Father's constantly working at us, constantly desiring for us to grow. That's why He's torn the veil. <laughs> you know, if we look at, at, at the works of Yeshua at the cross, and we look at what He's done, Every step he took was so that we could be propelled. Every single thing he did. First of all, he forgives all our sins. Then he tears the veil. His blood cleanses us. We literally have the ability as we step into him to be pure as white as snow. That the Father no longer, like in the Old Testament, said, I can no longer look at you because of your sins. I've turned my face from you. But now because of what Yeshua did on the cross, the Father can't stop looking at us because he sees me as white as snow. Pure. Holy, set apart, righteous. Okay, and of course because the veil is torn, I no longer have to live in this, this kingdom. I don't have to live in this kingdom. I can still have dominion over this kingdom, but I don't have to live here. I live within the heart of Yahweh. That's the place that He prepared for me to live in. He says, come live and move and have your being in me. It is the Aleph and the Taf. It's going back into the beginning. It's having the understanding that I have to enter back into Him and become one with Him to such a degree that the fullness of life can protrude out of me no matter what and how I do it. But I'm no longer affected by the earth and its temptation from that what the enemy wants to bring. That's why dividing soul and spirit separates me from the way my soul used to operate. But if you're not being divided, then you would constantly want to go back to the ways of your soul. And love, okay, the love of Jesus as we experience victory over our sins. You know, I, I have to look back at my life, and, I, and I, I've shared this many times, and I always think it's a very funny testimony, but I remember sharing my testimony the very first time after I got born again. And the lady stopped me halfway and said, wow, you can swear. You know, I mean, and then from there, of course, my next step was to stop swearing. 
because I obviously realized I was a, an Olympic swearer and I could get gold medal every time. And actually, I think that I might have created some words that you guys use today because I was just that good. And of course, I come from Western area, which is a little mining town in South Africa. And the miners there, they are nasty. I love them very much because my father was there, my mother was there, my brother, my brother-in-law, my brother was a miner, my brother was a, a mine captain, my brother-in-law was a mine captain or a mine supervisor or whatever. Everyone that lives there works in the mines, but they are rough. Wow. You know, the edges are not, are not nicely and nice and smooth. But I'll give you an example. I go to a nightclub. I haven't been there in the city for a very long time. I go to the nightclub. I've been there for five minutes. And as I just walked out, I wasn't saying anything or looking at anybody or nothing. I walked out and there's this young man standing in front of me. What's your problem? I'm like, I'm like what? what? <laughs> I didn't look at him. I didn't say anything. He just came out looking for trouble with me. And that, that, was the, that was the first five minutes at the club. I was in a fight with that guy. Because I beat him up, his uh, older brother or friend came and attacked me from the back. After I beat him up, the whole club wanted to beat me up. So then I said, okay, let my friends and my girlfriend, Claire, is so funny. That night, while wow, this guy's ugly, hitting me in his ear, and the blood's coming out of his ear, and she's on his back. And I'm like, baby, what are you doing? Get off his back. You know, she's fighting him, and I'm fighting him, oh my lord. And so we go to another club. I'm in that club for five minutes, and there's a guy looking for trouble with me. So I give him a big slap, and I pick him up, and after I helped him up, I go to the bar and there's another guy there looking for trouble with me. Wow. And I'm looking at my friends, I'm saying, okay, we need to get out of this town. Is there something wrong with these people? <laughs> That's a crazy nuts. But they're wild, they swear. I'm telling you, my sister, I, she gave, gave her life to the Lord eventually. But I mean, I can remember, I could no longer listen to her speak because I would find myself counting the swear words while she's talking to me. And the same with my mom. My mom was a very special, beautiful young lady. She was a social worker in my town. Everybody knew her. But wow, they could swear. Let me tell you. Very Olympic. And everybody was like that. Unless, of course, you were born again or you were raised differently. But most of the people in my town was just miners and worked on the mine. And I say miners, but there would be mine captains and there would be um, surveyors and they would do all kinds of other things, not just the mining, the miners themselves. But swearing was our thing. And I'm looking back at my life and I'm thinking, wow, I've changed. It's amazing. And of course, everything is about drinking and sleeping around because there's nothing else to do. I mean, literally, I mean, you, you make sure, are you you're my mother or my ex-girlfriend? You know, is that my sister or is that my, oh you know, my, my mother? Is, it's all like incest. I, I, not really. It's not that bad, but, but it's bad. You know, I remember being at a barbecue with my sister and some of her friends. And the lady made a statement. She said to my sister, don't you want to take my son? And I thought she was just joking, but she was giving her child away. She did not want it. I mean, of course, because everybody falls pregnant at a young age. It's, it's just drug abuse and it's all this stuff happening. So that's what I was born into. You know, I wasn't born in that time. We moved over there over many years. But I, I was born in that vicinity, in that area. And I will also give you an idea. Uh, Randfontein, Krugersdorp, Western area, Carltonville. It's all mining areas. And they're in the Guinness Book of Records for most alcohol consumed per square meter. All right. Amazing. <laughs> that's pretty talented. So it's amazing to look back how the Father has changed me, how He has shifted me into a new perception, new life. I, I take this crown, and I must be honest, I wear it very proudly. Satan has many times in my walk tried to take it, but I love the fact that I can nail him to the cross and beat the living snot out of him. Have you ever done that? It is fun. It is a lot of fun. Thank you, Lord. See, every, every step you take closer to victory over things you find yourself bound in, it's a dimensional step deeper into the crown of life. 
I would almost go as far as to say that there's dimensions within every crown because it's like everything else in our walk. Some is milk, some is meat, some is mystery. So of course you have the milk of the, the, the crown of life, you have the meat of the crown of life, and of course you have the mystery of the crown of life. It starts off with just having victory over sin. It goes deeper and deeper when you literally are so in one with Him that the life you live is a life consumed in the life that is ordained and destined for you. It goes beyond what you can perceive because it's that Zoe life. And a matter of fact, it's literally being in a place where you only eat of the tree of life and live in that fullness of the life that comes out of that, which is the fullness of Christ. And so we begin to understand what the Father has made available for us. Do not fear any of those things which you are, are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you in prison, that you may be tested. <laughs> and don't get afraid now, I'm just reading something out of the Bible. And you have uh, had tribulation for 10 days. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. But the Father is opening a doorway here uh, as we step deeper into what He's releasing. It says things like, if you begin to walk as an overcomer, I would literally give you the ability to go behind what you've believed all your life. Because there's a dimension of intimacy, because let me express to you that every time you sin, every time you find yourself doing something, you're cheating on your lover. Yeah. Now, I don't know how you see it, but that's just logic. You know, because if I, if I sin, I have taken my eyes off uh, Yeshua that I love with all my heart, mind, body, soul, and strength. As a matter of fact, I have stepped out of His kingdom, and I have to step into a realm that I used to live in. I have to go down to a place where I was saved from, that I was delivered from. I have to go back into that realm. I have to resubmit myself to a demonic entity that wants to kill, steal, and destroy for me to enter into an act of sin. So in essence, it's more than just, okay, well, I just fell, and I can quickly stand up and run back. No, in essence, you made a big, big boo-boo. Yeah. <laughs> okay? Because I had to go back to, no, no, it doesn't feel like that because there's no condemnation, and I'm not putting any condemnation on anybody, but the Father's desire for us is to begin to understand the magnitude of, 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 of walking in sin. Now, I'm not saying that I'm sinless in what I'm teaching. I'm saying that every time I do sin, that's the reality that I have to face. I have to understand that I just cheated on the one that I love with all my heart, mind, body, soul, and strength. And the idea is, of course, that I grow in my love for Him to such an extent that I will no longer fall back into that which I know He hates. And, of course, His mercy and His grace beyond we can fathom. Because I can't imagine that with my wife. Sorry. After the first mistake like that, I'll hear this. And the second sound, I will probably not hear. Everyone else will hear it. I don't think there will be any mercy. I would not expect any either. And Jehovah formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and he became a living soul. See that the idea that the Father has here with this crown of life is that we go back to that place in the spirit where he breathed the fullness of life into us, that Ruach. It's a dimension of the Father that adds every dimension of life to you that was taken after sin. You got that? Yeah, yeah. Although I have life, so I still live, that's not the life he's talking about. It's only life is a God type of life, which means you walk in the image and the likeness and the power and the glory and the fire of Yahweh. That's why Yeshua died on the cross, to restore life to us in that dimension. Not just life to me breathing, because that's the Father's blessing to me, it's his breath. Yeah. But that same breath is what gave me life. And the idea of the crown of life is to regain the fullness of life so I can operate in that dimension of life, which is understanding, perceiving a deep, deep intimacy with the Father, beyond that which I have ever fathomed to understand. A dimension that opens up when I walk in intimacy with Him.
And uh, it's in, in Genesis 3. And Jehovah said, Behold, the man has become as one of us, to know good and evil. And now let us, let he put forth his hand, lest he put forth his hand, and take also of the tree of life, and eat, and live forever. Therefore Jehovah God sent forth from the garden of Eden, to till the, the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden the cherubims and the flaming, a flaming sword which turns every day, every day, every way, <laughs> to keep the way, the way of the tree of life. Now I need you to understand something. The tree of life was taken because the father knew, after I've eaten of the tree of good and evil, if I then go and eat of the tree of life, then that will enter into the heavens. So I was taken out and no longer have access. But now that I have access back into the garden through the blood of Yeshua and the torn veil, the, the, the first thing He desires of us to do is to go eat of the tree of life. Because it regains the fullness of this crown. The idea of eating of the tree of life is very similar than taking communion. It's changing and shifting a DNA strand inside of you for you to become that which you were originally intended to be. It's eating and drinking of all of what's available for you as a son in the kingdom of God to give you the life that you were ordained to live, the life that you agreed to on your scroll. And of course, Satan will do everything in his power to keep that from you. That's why he knows that if you fall for temptation, he can take that life from you. If you fall into temptation and you're not living a life as an overcomer, he can take from you. And that, of course, is his desire. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Now, I'm going to understand God does not tempt anybody. Right? It's not part of his character. Did Jesus get tempted? Yes. Did he resist every temptation? Yes. Why? Because he was not born into sin. Right? Because of his bloodline. Yeah. Mary's bloodline and his uh, father's bloodline. Now, his father's bloodline is God. That changes everything. So because of the bloodline, he wasn't born into sin. That's why my children, whether you believe this or not, I do not care, is not born into sin. The Bible says that everyone is born into sin, but they cannot be because myself and my wife are born again. Uh, yes. <coughs> we were born again <coughs> before we got married. Do you understand that? So my children is not born into sin. They're born out of a different DNA strand. And they have the ability, just as Yeshua, and I'm not saying they're walking in that perfection. They could and they should. But because of what they were born into, they don't need to sin. I don't no longer have the excuse to sin because my bloodline was changed when I was born again from above. And so does yours. Because I'm now aligned with his DNA and I'm in his bloodline. And his bloodline is pure and sinless. Amen. Amen. And so we need to begin to understand what that allocates to me as a son. It aligns me to be perfect. That's why he says things in the Bible like, be perfect for I'm perfect. And of course we were taught all our lives that we can't be perfect. But if he says it, then we should walk in that full. But what is perfection? It's not what you think. Because sin is not what you think. Because we were taught that sin is this, 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 and this. And if you do that, that, or that, then that's, that's wrong and it's evil and you're probably going to go to hell. So repent or die. <laughs> but sin is missing the mark. So it's knowing where you're heading and then purposefully turning away from the goal. Not accidentally slipping or accidentally making a mistake, jumping up and going straight back at where you were going. No, purposefully turning your back on knowing where you're meant to go. That's sin. And when we begin to understand that our focus is not on our actions, because sin is not what I do, sin is what I am. Now in the blood and through the, the cross of Yeshua, I am no longer sin. So now, because I am no longer that, I am a redeemed of the Son of the Most High, I have sin. But I also have a choice to continue in sin. That's why the crown of life elevates me out of that place. And of course, that's why Satan will do everything in his power to take that from me. Exciting, isn't it? Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. 
Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Now we all know that story, right? <laughs> the spirit is perfect. After my spirit gets born again and my soul and my spirit is divided, I have the ability through Christ and in Christ, living out of the kingdom of heaven, to let my spirit is extremely holy and extremely pure. My spirit in essence cannot sin. It has no record of sin. If you've been in the kingdom of heaven, you will very quickly understand that there's no record in the heavens of sin. That's why an angel can stand right next to you while you're in your, your, your pinnacle of sin and not flinch. Because he comes from a kingdom where there's no record of sin. So we need to begin to understand my spirit, <clears throat> as being the primary being, has to affect my soul and my body. And when my spirit is consumed and walking in the crown of life, I will constantly find myself victorious over every temptation that comes. Right. Remind yourself that the temptation is not the sin. I remember, now this is really weird, and I'm always embarrassed saying it, but I was tripping on acid. Now, I don't know if you guys know what that is. <laughs> It's one nasty, nasty drug. <clears throat> it's a elusive drug. So it's very spiritual. I would, I would say I was, I was a backslidden Christian, and I was living. Me and Claire were living together. Now, for those who don't know the story, when me and Claire decided to get married, we were already together for five years. We were living together, sleeping together, doing everything married people would do together. And then when the Lord said we should get married, because we were getting back to the Lord, we, we moved out. She moved with her parents. I lived, moved with my parents, and for one year. We lived separately, we didn't sleep together until we got married. But I remember being, I uh, tripping my little head off, lying in bed, and the vision that I was seeing was extremely vivid. I remember it being so extremely vivid that I was lying in bed, and um, I saw Satan in the one side saying, this is what I know you want, and this is what I will give you. It was to be a trade of my soul. And it was really taking place on this acid trip in the spirit. Where Satan was showing me uh, everything that I desire. Um, at that point it was women and uh, drugs and uh, money and cars and big houses. And everything that a earthly perverted soul would want. And I was very excited about this. But uh, I was also in the same breath within a uh, dimension that I can't even explain. Because it was a mountain and there was fire and lightning coming out of it. I was sitting in it, and I was constantly saying, well, show me, show me what you'll give me again. Wow. And that's all I did. I just said, well, show me again, but I, I was in the mountain. I didn't want to accept what the temptation was. Wow, wow. Now, I was a Baxter Christian, but let me tell you, before I backslid, I was, uh, I was uh, finished my theology. I did my bachelor's degree in theology. I was on fire from Messiah. I was already preaching in schools and in, and in uh, churches, and I was prophesying to nations, doing all kinds of things. And when I backslid, um, that was obviously my heart. Now I say when I backslid, that was so many years ago that uh, I'm not too embarrassed to talk about my backslid stage. And also, that's where I met my wife. Um, so, and, and of course, I learned almost more in the four years that I backslid than what I, what I really learned in all the years of theology that I've done up to the point before I started up again. But I remember... Satan was literally doing everything in his power to show me um, what he would give me if I give up my salvation, if I give up my faith, give up my God and come over to his side. And that was a temptation that if I had given in to, I would not have been here. Um, according to what I believe and heard, that is the contract you sign giving over your soul yeah. to Satan. And he promises fame. He promised all these things. If you look into the world, you can literally go speak to some of these people and you'll find that that's exactly what happened to them. Because the drugs that they have available today is a gateway into the spirit where Satan can literally uh, line you with what you desire and he will give it to you. And so remind yourself that the temptation is not to sin, it's the falling into temptation that brings the destruction. Okay. So the Father's desire for you is to be reminded in your life right now, where did you lose your crown? Did you lose that crown? Now when I say, did you lose the crown of life, do you, do you struggle with temptation? Do you fall into the temptation? Now temptation doesn't always have to be a sin. 
You know, temptation can just be when you know you have to spend, spend time with Yahweh right now, but the temptation is not to. The temptation is to go do something else. And what the other thing is, might not even be sin. But Satan knows if he can keep you away, if he can have you be disobedient, if he can have you shift your focus away from where you know it's supposed to be, that's him taking your crown. Um, if someone comes up to you and says something stupid and you know that that's affected you subconsciously so much that you no longer press in as hard as what you used to because they might think you look freaky. You might be uh, dancing too hard in the church. You might be clapping when everyone's in worship. Or you might be jumping in the back when everyone's sitting down and be, be calm and someone would go up to you and say, stop. And it affects you in some way, fashion or form. That's when someone takes it to your crown. Yeah. You got to understand that? Let's stand. Oh. <laughs> and I was already 50 minutes. 55 minutes. And what we're going to do is we're just going to go through, uh, just explain, you know, if you didn't lose a crown, we'll do this every week. It's just to regain the crown. Because Satan loves taking from us. And if we in any fa way, fashion, or form open a door for him to come in and take from us, you'll do it. You know, and I know as someone that lives in the spirit, it's so easy to step into the flesh. And you might be in the flesh without sinning, because I can find myself, because nowadays it's very easy for me to swear in Afrikaans. <laughs> and it doesn't sound so bad in Afrikaans as what it does in English, and of course no one in my household understands what I'm saying. But it's still sin. It's still not right. right. Although it's fine because I'm the only one that understands it, and my kids go, what did you say, Dad? No, nothing. I know that there's, there's a dimension of flesh yeah. that's taken place that I need to shift out of. Yeah. So it's very easy to step into the flesh, and that's when Satan tries to come in and take. Right. Okay, so we need to always be aware. That's why the Bible talks about the fact that we must have a vigilant mind. Constantly be focused. Understand that Satan is there to kill sinners right now. I don't pay many attention. He brings no fear to me whatsoever. I don't live in that realm. I have the ability, like David, through the mercy and the grace of God, to constantly and very easily uh, confess my sin and ask for forgiveness. Constantly. Let me tell you, when you've got four kids, I'm sure you guys know, having ten, that it's not the easiest thing in the world. You know, you have to constantly <clears throat> fight a fight. This peace is a very mild thing in the house, especially at certain times of the day, yeah? Five, four, half past four, five o'clock, maybe at six o'clock, then it hits, it hits crazy hour. And that's where all kinds of words and frustrations and irritations come out. And Satan knows your weakness. He knows where to push the buttons. Huh? Oh, they sing, let it go, let it go. We only watched that a million times. Yeah. <laughs> So what we need to do is we need to, we need to realize or recognize the place that you lost your crown. Crown of life is a biggie. It's the big one. It's something that you need to understand. Because even as a mature Christian, to live in constant victory is the Father's desire for you. But to find yourself not living in constant victory, victory as a constant Victoria, Victorian, operating in complete, as a complete overcomer, is, is a problem. You know, so we need to have the uh, desire in us to change. We have to understand the doors on the floor. You know, it's not something, no one, no one's perfect. And if you think you are, you're probably not. Sorry. <coughs> Sorry, if you're looking for the perfect church and you find it, don't go there. Because you're going to mess it up. Okay? So we need to find the place where we lost it. You go into your blood, up into your bloodline, you go into your, into your um, timeline, and in the spirit, and you'll find the Father will take you to the place where either through your sin or through a constant act of uh, um, disobedience or just through the enemy wanting to take from you because of your call and what's on your life, you will find where the enemy has taken it and where it is. The idea is to go find that crown. Then, of course, you want to repent, ask the Father to forgive you, and regain that crown. Once you've regained the crown, the idea is that you take it to the throne like the 24 hours, and you take it and you lay it at the feet of Yahweh, where He will immediately take it and multiply it back to you. That is how the Father operates. That's why I want to urge you, whenever you're trading, to never be afraid of what He asks you to give. Because He will always multiply it back to you. That's how the heart of the Father is. 
Okay, Father, we just want to come before your throne. We want to glorify and magnify and exalt you. Father, I thank you that we can, sort of being spirit beings, go into the spirit and take back what the enemy has taken from us. So as sons and daughters, as the ecclesia growing, as the ecclesia being propelled into a new dimension of growth, Father, we want to go and we want to begin to grow in leaps and bounds. As we take back what the enemy has stolen, Father, we begin to understand that, that this crown of life, represents a dimension of trials and tribulations that we have had victory over. We begin to understand that the temptations that the enemy puts before us literally wash like water off a duck's back because we no longer worry or protrude to those things. We are focused on you and all of you as we live in the Spirit. I thank you also, Father, that we begin to understand that the victorious life is in your bloodline. The victorious life is in the DNA, and that's why we eat of you and drink of you. So, Father, as tonight we step into you, we go find our crowns that the enemy has taken, we repent of, of it, and we ask you, Father, to multiply it back to us as we lay it down at your feet. We love you, we praise you, we glorify you. Lord, I pray that you bless everyone in this room. I pray, Father, you open up every doorway, every gate in every dimension of our lives for us to go deeper and deeper into you. I pray for a financial breakthrough, Lord. I pray, Father, for favor everywhere we go. I pray for the doors and businesses to open, Father. I ask your name will echo in the heart of everyone in this room and literally shape the nation in line. We love you. We thank you, Father. You're an awesome, majestic God. In the name of Yeshua. Amen. Amen.